Thank you very kindly. Mr. Chairman, members of this very fine and significant organization, the National Association of Radio Announcers, distinguished dais guests, ladies and gentlemen, I need not pause to say how very delighted I am to be here this evening and to share with you in your annual convention. I must apologize in the very beginning for being late tonight and for holding you up. I flew in today from San Francisco where I had to address the National Association of Real Estate Brokers last evening. And after a rather long and tiring flight, I found myself with endless appointments and endless paperwork to do because the 10th Annual Convention of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference will open in this very hotel on Monday evening. And I have the responsibility of doing a lot of paperwork in order to get ready for that convention, and a lot of last-minute things came up that I did not anticipate. And I certainly appreciate your patience and your kindness and your willingness uh, to wait. I'm indeed grateful to... Brother Jones, for these very kind and gracious words of introduction. As he introduced me, I felt something like the old maid who had never been married. And one day she went to work, and the lady for whom she worked said, Ann, I hear you're going to get married. She said, no, I'm not going to get married, but thank God for the rumor. And now, I know that all of these marvelous things that have been said about me can't be true, but thank God for the rumor. I value a special opportunity to address you this evening, for in my years of struggle, both north and south, I have come to appreciate the role which the radio announcer plays in the life of our people. For better or for worse, you are opinion makers in the community. And it is important that you remain aware of the power which is potential in your vocation. The masses of Americans who have been denied and deprived educational and economic opportunity are almost totally dependent on radio as their means of relating to the society at large. They do not read newspapers, though they may occasionally thumb through jet. Uh, Television speaks not to their needs, but to upper-middle-class America. One need only recall the Watts tragedy and the quick adoption of the burn, baby burn slogan to illustrate the pervasive influence of the radio announcer on the community. But while the establishment was quick to blame the tragedy of Watts, most unjustly on the slogan of Magnificent Montague, it has not been ready to acknowledge all of the positive features which grow out of your contribution to the community. No one knows the importance of tall Paul White and the massive nonviolent demonstrations of the youth of Birmingham in 1963. (laughs) 
are the funds raised by Purvis Spann for the Mississippi Summer Project of 1964. Are the consistent fundraising and voter education done for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Civil Rights Movement by Georgia Wood, my good friend of Philadelphia? Tonight, I want to say thank you, not just to these few, but to all of you who have given leadership to our people in thousands of unknown and unsung ways. We would certainly not have come so far without your support. In a real sense, you have paved the way for social and political change by creating a powerful cultural bridge between black and white. School integration is much easier now that they share a common music, a common language, and enjoy the same dances. You introduced youth to that music created the language of soul and promoted the dance which now sweeps across race, class, and nation. It is quite amazing to me to hear the joyful rhythms which I found time to enjoy as a youth here in Atlanta years ago, coming back across the Atlantic with an English accent, are to see... are to see the Senator Javits and the Senator Kennedys lost in the dances which we created. Yes, you have taken the power which old Sam had buried deep in his soul and throughout amazing technology performed the cultural conquest that surpasses even Alexander the Great and the culture of classical Greece. But my brothers and my sisters, we are only beginning. We still have a long, long way to go. And I would like to share with you the burden on my heart about the problems which still confront us. And if I would use a subject for what I would like to say to you this evening, I would call it transforming a neighborhood into a brotherhood. And I want to try to tell you the truth tonight. I want to speak honestly and frankly about many problems that we face in our nation and that we face in the world. For America sorely needs to hear the truth at this time. And I still believe that freedom is the bonus you receive for telling the truth. As Jesus said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, transforming a neighborhood into a brotherhood. Now, there can be no gain saying of the fact that America has brought the nation, and the world to an awe-inspiring threshold of the future. We've built machines that think and instruments that peer into the unfathomable ranges of interstellar space. We've built gargantuan bridges to span the seas. 
and gigantic buildings to kiss the skies. Through our airplanes, we've dwarfed distance and placed time in chains. And our jet planes have, con have literally compressed into minutes distances that once took weeks and months. Bob Hope talked about this new jet age in which we live once. He said it is an age in which it is possible to take a non-stop flight from Los Angeles, California to New York City, a distance of about 3,000 miles. And if on taking off in Los Angeles you develop hiccups, you will hick in Los Angeles and cup in New York City. You know, it is possible because of the time difference to take a non-stop flight from Tokyo, Japan on Sunday morning and arrive in Seattle, Washington on the preceding Saturday night. And when your friends meet you at the airport and ask when you left Tokyo, you will have to say, I left tomorrow. <laughs> this is what our nation has done through the invention of the Wright brothers, right on down to the present day. Yes, through our spaceships, we've literally carved highways through the stratosphere. And through our submarines, we've penetrated oceanic depths. All of this is a dazzling picture of modern man scientific and technological progress. But what I want to say to you tonight, my friends, is that when we look to the other side, something basic is missing. We suffer from a kind of poverty of the spirit which stands in glaring contrast to our scientific and technological abundance. We've learned to swim the seas like fish and to fly the air like birds, and yet we have not learned the simple art of walking the earth as brothers and sisters. And this is the great dilemma facing America. And you know, it comes to this point now, we must all learn to live together as brothers or we will all perish together as fools. <laughs> now, there are three things that we must deal with if we are going to transform this neighborhood into a brotherhood. We've got to deal with the problem of racism. We've got to deal with the problem of economic injustice or poverty. And we've got to deal with the problem of war. And let me start out talking about racism. And more and more, we've got to tell the truth to America about this problem. And the truth means saying to our nation that the roots of racism are very deep in America, and they are still here, and that racial injustice is still the black man's burden and the white man's shame. Now, admittedly, we've made some strides, we've made some progress, but this shouldn't cause any of us to become apathetic or lax or complacent. For me, we must recognize that the plant of freedom has grown only a bud and not yet a flower. The problems that we face 
are still very serious. Now we hear a lot of talk these days about the so-called white backlash. I want to tell you what the white backlash really is. It's nothing new. It's merely a new name for an old phenomenon. It is a continued expression of the same vacillation, the same ambivalence that's characterized white society from the very founding of this nation. On the Statue of Liberty, we read that America is the mother of exiles. But it doesn't take us long to realize that America has been the mother of its white exiles from Europe. She has not evinced the same maternal care and concern for her black exiles who were brought to this country in chains from Africa. And it is no wonder that our slave foreparents could think about it and they could start singing in a beautiful soul song, in a beautiful sorrow song. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. <laughs> It was this sense of estrangement and rejection that caused our forebears to use such a metaphor. You see, what has happened is that our nation has constantly made a positive step forward on civil rights, but it has usually simultaneously made a step backwards. There has never been a single solid, determined commitment on the part of the vast majority of white Americans on the question of genuine equality for the black man. In 1863, the Negro was freed from the bondage of physical slavery through the Emancipation Proclamation. But he wasn't given any land to make that Freedom meaningful. And you know, it was something like having a man unjustly imprisoned for 30 or 40 years, and suddenly you discover that he's innocent, that he's been unjustly jailed for 30 or 40 years. And then you simply go up to the man and say, now you are free. But you don't give him any bus fare to get to town. You don't give him any money to buy any clothes to put on his back. You don't give him any money to get on his feet so that he can rise up once more as a man. But this is what happened to the black man in America. We must remember this, that at the very same time when America refused to give the black man anything, just said you're free, he was left penniless, illiterate, Standing out in a situation not knowing what to do and where to go. But we must not forget that at the same time the Negro was being treated like this. America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest. It says that our country was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. It refused to undergird its black peasants who were brought in chains from Africa with an economic floor. And so emancipation for the Negro was freedom to hunger. It was freedom to the winds and rains of heaven. It was freedom without a roof over their heads. Freedom without bread to eat. Freedom without land to cultivate. It was freedom and famine at the same time. And it is a miracle that the Negro has survived. But the white backlash didn't stop there. In 1875, the nation passed a civil rights bill and refused to enforce it. In 1964, the nation passed an even weaker civil rights bill and even to this day has failed to enforce it in all of its dimensions. In 1954, the Supreme Court declared segregation unconstitutional in the public schools. 
Today, less than 10% of the Negro students of the South are attending integrated schools, which means that we have made 1% progress a year, and if it continues at this rate, it will take another 94 years to integrate the schools. <laughs> Suburban politicians talk eloquently against open housing, and at the same time, or in the same breath, they contend that they are not racist. All of this tells us, my friends, that the white backlash is nothing new. The fact is that America has been backlashing on the question of genuine equality for the black man for more than 300 years. And this is something that we must realize and that we must see. And this is why I say to you that our job is still difficult. We still need your voices. We still need your support. And there isn't any way to solve this problem without pressure. There isn't any way to solve the problem of racial injustice without persistent, nonviolent pressure. There have been those who felt that it could be done another way. I was a great man in our history, and I do not come to you to criticize him tonight, because I think he was a sincere man. His name was Booker T. Washington. Mr. Washington believed that the problem could be solved through pressureless persuasion. He sincerely felt that. He felt that if you didn't push things too fast and if you didn't bother the white South, if you didn't try to make the white man do something that he didn't want to do at that particular time, he would ultimately come around. Mr. Washington sincerely felt this, but he misread history. He did follow that approach. He started saying everything that the white people wanted to hear. He was honored for it. He was called the responsible leader. You know, I always get a little worried when I'm referred to as a responsible leader because so often... When some people call you a responsible leader, they are really telling you that you are a leader who will not tell the truth on behalf of your people. So often they mean that you are a leader more concerned about your budget than you are concerned about the freedom of your people. So often they really mean that you are a leader willing to say to the white power structure what they want to hear rather than what they ought to hear. Booker T. Washington went on with the notion of pressureless persuasion. And the reactionary forces of the white South used that only to plunge deeper into the oppression of the Negro. He told us to let our buckets down where we were, and the problem was that there wasn't much water in the well. And somewhere we must come to see that we must rise up, stand on our own two feet, and say to our white brothers that we are determined to be men. This is what the movement is saying. We are somebody. We are determined to gain our freedom. And we are going to start with ourselves by freeing our own psyche, our own souls. This is where we've got to start first. For well, you see, in the final analysis, if we're going to be truly free, nobody else can do that for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do that for us. No Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can do that for us. If we are going to be truly free, we must reach down into the inner depths of our being and sign with the pen and ink of assertive 
manhood, our own emancipation proclamation. And we must come to say, yes, I'm black, but I'm black but beautiful. I'm somebody. I have a rich and noble heritage, however exploited and painful it has been. And I've made a contribution to this issue. And so the responsibility is broad and it is wide. There's need now for repentance. And this is the only way that we are going to transform this neighborhood into a brotherhood. Now, the final thing I want to talk about, and I've talked longer than I expected, but I've got to bring this out. I believe in telling the truth. We're going to transform this neighborhood into a brotherhood. We've got to get rid of war. John Fitzgerald Kennedy said on one occasion that mankind must put an end to war. A war will put an end to mankind. There's a war taking place today in a little Asian country. The tragedy is that it is the most powerful, the richest nation in the world that happens to be a predominantly white nation, at war with one of the smallest, poorest nations that happens to be a colored nation. We all know the physical Casualties, the nightmarish physical, physical casualties of that war. We see them. We see the rice fields of that little Asian country being trampled at will and burned at whim. We see crying mothers with little babies tightly clutched in their arms as they stand and watch their little huts burst forth into flames. We see fine Young men from our own nation, dying in mounting numbers, being wounded every day. We see Vietnamese boys and girls, men and women, dying every day. We see little children being burned with napalm. That isn't all that's happening as a result of that war. That war in Vietnam has isolated our great nation morally and politically. There isn't a single ally, major ally of the United States would dare send the troop to Vietnam. The allies that have been with us in other wars in the past aren't there. Today we stand without any friends in the world where this war is concerned, with the exception of a few puppet client nations like Taiwan, Thailand, South Korea, and that's about it. War has damaged our image in the world, it strengthened the military industrial complex in our country, and it strengthened the forces of reaction. It's diverted attention from civil rights. All of the emotions and all of the energies and all of the resources that should be going into civil rights to solve the problems of our cities are so often going into that war. And here we are fighting two wars. A war against poverty which ends up not even being a good skirmish against poverty. And a war in Vietnam and we are losing both of them, morally and politically. <laughs> this war in Vietnam places us in the position of being against the self-determination of the Vietnamese people. And just a little history will tell you what I mean here. In 1945, the Republic of Vietnam declared itself independent after the joint occupation of the French and the Japanese. Incidentally, this was before communist China came into being. 
And the interesting thing is, when they declared themselves independent, they quoted our own Declaration of Independence in that document of freedom and applied for membership in the French Commonwealth. And then you remember what happened after that? The French sought to recapture their former colony. They engaged in a war for eight years, a brutal war. But France didn't fight that war alone, trying to put those people back into colonialism. It was our country that supported it to the tune of more than three billion dollars. Toward the end of the war, we were meeting more than 80% of the war cost. And even when the French came to their senses and started to tie of their reckless action, even before their defeat at DNB in Fu in 1954, we tried to urge them to go on. And when the Geneva Accord was reached in 1954, we did everything possible to sabotage it. I have to tell you the truth tonight, my friends. We helped install a man by the name of Diem as premier. The Geneva Court said that there would be elections in 1956. Mr. Diem got in office and said there will not be any elections in 1956. And they were not held. He turned out to be one of the most ruthless dictators of modern history. And for those who want to continue to lie to the American public, I wish you would go back and tell them that the Viet Cong did not start in the North. It started as a resistance movement in the South to the oppressive tactics of Mr. Diem. And the North did not start sending supplies and troops in the South until our country escalated that war. And it is necessary to say... It is necessary to say, my friend, these are facts that must be known, and I say to you that you won't get them in the newspaper. They are not there. (laughs) Dr. Bernard Fall, one of the great authorities on Vietnam, who was killed not long ago in a plane crash, said less than 25% of the members of the Viet Cong were communists. Yet the American public was brainwashed into believing that this was communist aggression, a communist attempt to take over the world. And at the same time, nobody would say to that same American public that if it was a communist takeover, why is it that Soviet Russia doesn't have a single fighting troop in Vietnam? Why is it that China doesn't have a single fighting troop in Vietnam? And yet we are 10,000 miles away from home with 500,000 troops and getting ready to add more and take some of your and my tax to do it. (laughs) What we've got to see is that people in Vietnam are fighting for something else. They have no love for China animated by nationalism and a a desire for self-determination, not by communism, basically. This is what has not been said. But not only did we support Mr. Diem, supported another 12 military dictatorships, and finally we supported a man named Mr. Key. That's who we're supporting now. Now in America, in the civil rights movement, we would call him an Uncle Tom. And we would call him an Uncle Tom because Mr. Key fought against his own people as a mercenary with the French. Mr. Key was the man who said that Hitler was his supreme hero of history, and he's never changed it to this day. This is who we are supporting. I came by here to tell you the truth about it tonight. So we put ourselves in the position of being against the self-determination of a people. It's time now that we see this. It's hurt our humility. It's left us 
with the notion that we are to be the policemen of the world, that we have some divine messianic power to patrol the whole world. We have even set our own house in order. Senators and congressmen will vote joyously to send billions of dollars to Vietnam. And many of those same congressmen will vote against a fair housing bill which will make it possible for a veteran from Vietnam who happens to be a Negro to live anywhere that he wants to live when he comes back home. Negroes and white boys will fight in brutal solidarity on the battlefields of Vietnam. But when they get back home, it's doubtful that their children will be able to sit together in the same classroom because most of the schools of this country are segregated. Negro soldiers will die in Vietnam. Sometime they'll come back home to be buried in Wetumpka, Alabama, and can't even be buried there. It's time to set our own house in order. <laughs> the other thing is we've increased the possibilities as a result of this war, for World War III. And there's a danger now if we keep it going. The whole of mankind will be annihilated because of the power, destructiveness of nuclear weapons of warfare. If we continue to flirt unhesitatingly with war, our earthly habitat will be transformed into an inferno that even the mind of Dante could not imagine. And I call now upon our nation to make an honest confession. Oh, I have to do it on my knees at night. I make mistakes tactically. I make mistakes morally. I get on my knees and confess it and ask God to forgive me. The thing that I still love about President Kennedy, and I'm sorry he isn't with us today, is that he had the ability to say I made a mistake when he allowed the Bay of Pigs invasion to take place in Cuba, he said, I made a mistake. I never should have listened to the experts. And the time has come now for President Johnson and our government to say to the world, we made a mistake in Vietnam. My friends, I'm about through now, but I want to say that I come to you to say this tonight because I want you to know my views because you are the persons who so often interpret them. And I want you to hear them. I wanted you to hear them from my mouth. Now, a lot of people, you know, they say a lot of funny things and a lot of things they really believe. There are those who say, now, why don't you stick to Civil rights, aren't you hurting the civil rights movement by taking a stand against a war in Vietnam? I've said to them so often, before I became a civil rights leader, I was a preacher of the gospel. And I take that ministry seriously. When I was ordained to the ministry, it was a commission. Bring the moral and ethical insights of our Judeo-Christian heritage to bear on the social evils of our day. And I could not remain silent as I saw what was happening in Vietnam. And then for those who say to me, stick to civil rights, I have another answer. And that is that I fought too long and too hard now against segregated public accommodations to end up segregating my moral concern. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Others can do what they want to do. That's their business. Other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration. That's their business. But I must say tonight, 
that I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And it would be rather absurd for me to be working for integrated schools and integrated other things and not be concerned about the survival of a world in which to integrate. <laughs> Somebody said to me not long ago, aren't you hurting the cause and hurting your own budget and don't you think now that you're going to have to start talking more in terms of the administration's policy in Vietnam because many people who once respected you will lose respect for you. And I looked in that brother's face and I said, I'm sorry, you don't know me. I'm not a consensus leader. I don't determine what is right and wrong by sitting down looking at the budget of SCLC and seeing how many of the contributors may not uh, agree. Oh, no. Sure, my stand has hurt the budget. I don't determine what is right and wrong by taking a gallop poll of the majority opinion. Ultimately, a genuine leader is not a searcher for consensus, but he's a molder of consensus. And on some positions... <laughs> on some positions, coward is asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? And then vanity comes along and asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? <clears throat> there comes a time when one must take a stand that's neither safe, not politic, not popular, but he must take it because it is right. And that's where I stand today. <laughs> and I do it because I love America. I'm not on a hate America campaign. I love this nation. Been disappointed with her often, but there can be no great disappointment where there's not great love. So I stand up against racism, stand up against poverty and war, because they are evil and because I want our nation to solve all of these problems. And I say to you in conclusion that I'm not in despair. I'm going on with a faith in the future. I couldn't work if I didn't have that faith. These have been difficult days for all of us. I go on with the faith that we're going to get there. By and by, even on the race question, I go on with the faith that this problem can and will be solved. Our goal is freedom. And I believe we're going to get there because however much America has strayed away from it, the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be as a people, our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. Before the Pilgrim Fathers landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before Jefferson etched across the pages of history, the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence, we were here. Before the beautiful words of the Star-Spangled Banner were written, we were here. And for more than two centuries, our forebears labored here without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters in the midst of the most oppressive and humiliating conditions and yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to grow and develop. And if the inexpressible cruelties of slavery couldn't stop us, the opposition that we now face, including the so-called white backlash, will surely fail. We are going to win our freedom. We are going to win our freedom... We're going to win our freedom. And therefore, my friends, I can still sing, We Shall Overcome.
we shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We shall overcome because Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullard Bryant is right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold wrong, forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. And so let us keep moving. Let us keep climbing. Let us not allow anything to stop us as we move toward the goal of peace, the goal of brotherhood. A great and noble black bard who left us a few days ago, who will go down in history for his eloquent pen, Langston Hughes, had a mother to utter some words to a son. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Had tax in it. Boards torn up places with no carpet on the floor. Bare. But all the time I has been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So, boy, don't you stop now. Don't you sit down on the steps because you find this kind of hard. But I'm still going, boy. I'm still climbing. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. Well, life for none of us has been a crystal stair. We must keep moving. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Ladies and gentlemen... Our thanks, our thanks to our hosts this evening, RCA Victor Record Company, for giving us the opportunity of hearing. Thank each of you for coming, and may we close with the expression, God bless Martin Luther King. <laughs>